Shalom Aleichem, and welcome back to my makeshift office. I again appreciate the University of Haifa providing me with this nachlas, which I think was delivered by a uh, German-Italian-Spanish sociologist economist, and it's absolutely marvelous, and I appreciate it very, very much. Today we move on to Hasidism, and the focus of the lecture today uh, is actually going to be on the general history of Hasidic movement. Instead, we're going to use the readings the wonderful readings by, by Raphael Mahler and the more recent assignment by Racham Manikin on the Galician context in particular. But what I want to accomplish today is to introduce you to the world of Hasidut, of Hasidism, uh, both in terms of theology and especially the social history. And this is how we have to understand the Hasidic movement, because the Hasidic revolution was both a social and a religious revolution. We have to understand both aspects. On the one hand, we have a social revolution happening. Hasidic Jews identify themselves based on their relationship to a specific charismatic saint known as a tzaddik or a rebbe. Uh, so on the one hand, we have a social organization going on here, as we'll understand uh, in a few minutes. And we also have a religious revolution because Hasidic movement is promoting a theology of divine imminence that's going to promote new forms of religious expression. For example, Devekut, Devekus, clinging to God and in new ways through ecstatic prayer or else through the tzaddik himself. Plus countless numbers of customs unique to the Hasidic world, some of them unique to specific Hasidic sects. So we wanted to approach Hasidic movement as this dual revolution. And here's our overview of what we're doing today. And the, the title is From the Besh to a Mass Movement. The Baal Shem Tov, the so-called founder of the Hasidic movement, will spend some time on him. And I'm using here uh, a stru structure first developed, or famously developed anyway, by Manuel Atkis, looking at three aspects of Israel Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, the Besht as a Baal Shem, we will explain in a moment. The Baal Shem Tov as a new type of Jewish leader. And the Baal Shem Tov is an innovative mystical theologian, and we'll look at all three of these. Then we'll look after the death of the Baal Shem Tov as the development of a Hasidic movement. And in particular, two areas. Number one, what happens in the dozen or so years after the Baal Shem Tov dies, when his, one of his most important disciples, Rabbi Dovber, the Magid of Mizrich takes over, and then after his death in 1772, the real spread of Hasidic movement throughout Eastern Europe. And finally, we'll spend some time looking at this new model of leadership, which is actually models of leadership, the Tzaddik, the Rebbe, which is perhaps the most innovative and controversial contribution of Hasidic movement to Judaism. This is more or less where we're going. I'll bring in Galician examples, Galician context when possible, but I'm going to rely very much on the readings to make that uh, Galician grounding for us. So we begin. So Israel Baal Shem Tov. By the way, this is a picture of the most famous book, not written by the Baal Shem Tov, but about him, the Shifrei Abesht. You might note that I don't have a picture of the Baal Shem Tov. That's not only because it's in the 18th century. We actually don't have any pictures, but I mention it to you because you might find, if you Google the name Israel Baal Shem Tov, a picture which is not a picture of the Baal Shem Tov, but rather of a different Baal Shem who lived in London, so don't, named Falk, so don't be deceived. Let's talk about the Besht for a little bit. 1700 to 1760, as you see on your screen, and he's called the Baal Shem Tov for a very good reason. He was a Baal Shem. He was a, not a good Baal Shem. The Tov doesn't modify Baal, it modifies Shem. He was a Baal and master of the good name, meaning, of course, the name of God. He's coming from Podolia, east of Galicia, in eastern Ukraine, uh, and he begins his career as a Baal Shem. That means he is a sort of shaman. Uh, he is writing amulets. He is exorcising demons. He is uh, traveling vast distances to heal the sick via either magical or uh, herbal remedies, whatever it takes. This is absolutely normative in pre-modern Jewish society. Actually, the magical aspect is normative even today in parts of Jewish society. These are not charlatans. These are not uh, uh, snake oil salesmen. These are a normal part of Jewish society in the 18th century. People believed in demons. They believed in magic. They believed in amulets. These are absolutely normal. It used to be rabbis would provide these services, but then the demand increased, and you have a professionalization of the Baal Shem. Uh, he's not a rabbi. He is earning his money, his livelihood, by providing magical services itinerantly, traveling to do so. And he was like other Baal Shem. 
Uh, he was doing the sorts of things that other Baal Hashem did. And if you want to begin with the Baal Shem Tov, we have to begin with that. Now, how was he different in other, words, in other ways? It, what was different about him? And I'll mention two aspects of, him, of the Baal Shem Tov as a Baal Shem that were different. Number one, he has apparently a much greater charisma. This is in general a good skill to have if you're going to be a Baal Shem. But with the Baal Shem Tov, with Israel Baal Shem Tov, with the Besht, it was particularly pronounced. Uh, he, people had an impression of him that he was able to bravely face metaphysical dangers that others would not. And he was also uh, extremely proud of his prophetic prowess, which people believed in. That's number one. And number two, he tended to monopolize. He really doesn't want to share his magical abilities or knowledge with other people. He felt it was for his purpose alone. And this leads me to the second point about the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem as a leader. You know, there were two groups of leaders in pre-modern Jewish society. You had the Parnassim and you had the Rabbanim. You have the rabbis and you have the wealthy uh, lay leadership. He was neither one of these. He was not a rabbi, nor was he especially uh, wealthy, as no, a Parnass in that sense. What he does instead is he forges for himself an unprecedented type of Jewish leader. He views himself not simply as a hired gun, as a Baal Shem, but rather as a leader of all Jews everywhere, endowed with the unique spiritual ability to defend them, to foresee future threats, and perhaps to avoid them. And one area where we see that is the Baal Shem Tov's transformation of a Kabbalistic notion, of, uh, I should say a Jewish mystical notion, called Aliyat HaNeshama, the ascent of the soul. This is not a new idea. We see this the very famous example for, uh, for, for example in the Talmud when Rabbi Akiva and his peers, four of them, ascend to the uh, Pardes. They have an ascent of the soul for the purpose of learning Torah secrets. That's the purpose of you having an ascent of the soul. We see other mystics throughout Jewish history doing this. The Arizal, Isaac Luria and Sfat had many such ascents where your soul ascends to higher places to celestial spheres, and thereby learn secrets of Torah that can only be learned in this way. But the Baal Shem Tov had a different purpose, and we know about this because of a very famous letter. There are actually three versions. It's a debate which version is most accurate and how we blend them, but there's a letter of the Baal Shem Tov describing what he was doing when he had his Aliyat and Neshama. And what he was doing was essentially rising up to the celestial spheres to defend Jews, the Jewish community, in the celestial court. He's traveling to the celestial spheres to act as the defense attorney in the court, bravely facing off against none less than Satan himself in the court to help the Jews down here. One of the most famous stories in this letter is he's going up to heaven, he's having this experience, and he happens to bump into none other than the Messiah. He says he's, he's not there to see the Messiah. He bumps into the Messiah. And what would a Jew do if he sees the Messiah? He's going to ask him one question. When are you coming? When are you coming to redeem the Jewish people? And the Messiah says to him, I'm coming when your teachings are spread out. When people learn your teachings, that's when I'm going to come. Now, if you read the continuation of the letter, so it's quite clear what he meant by that are various sophisticated Kabbalistic practices called Yehudim that only a few people could know. And even those people he was forbidden from telling. So in the end, you have here something of a passive messianic view. Nevertheless, we see from this that the Baal Shem Tov understands himself to be at the center of the cosmic process of redemption of the world. We also see here a messianism which is going to come out from time to time in Hasidic branches, most obviously today in Chabad Lubavitch. But in his case, we have what Gershom, Kalim, Gershom Shalom famously called a neutralization of the messianic element. There's a messianic drive, especially since Shabbatai Tzvi, that Jews want to be redeemed. They're longing to be redeemed. And what Hasidic movement will do is neutralize that, mo that, that, that drive and personalize it. Rather than seeking a national redemption, the return of Jewish people to the land of Israel and so on, they'll have a personal redemption of achieving a closeness with God heretofore unab un unable to achieve. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But in any event, we have here a new type of leader a magician mystic with the ability and the mission to defend and take care of all Israel. And he's traveling widely.
to expose himself to people unlike the withdrawn mystics of the past. And this uh, idea of the Baal Shem Tov, this identity, these activities of the Baal Shem Tov would have a tremendous impact in the future construction of Hasidic ideology, Hasidic society, and theology. And incidentally, we have from this book on your right, from the Shifchei Abesht, we have a description of what the Baal Shem Tov looked like when he was having this experience. And here's how it's described. The Besht was making, it says, terrible gestures. He bent backwards until his head came close to his knees. Everyone feared that he would fall down. They wanted to support him, but they were afraid to. His eyes bulged and he sounded like a slaughtered bull. He kept this up for about two hours. Two hours. Suddenly he stirred and straightened up. He prayed in a great hurry and finished the prayer. And we have to imagine the impact that this has. He's sitting here, it's the high holy days, he's in the front of a packed synagogue, and he's screaming like a slaughtered bull, contorting his body for two hours. So when he comes out of this trance, and he tells the people what he saw in the celestial spheres, there's a reason why this is influential. This is a successful, ecstatic, mystical experience. And this leads me to the third point about the Besht and why he's so important in the Hasidic movement. There is a mystical innovation happening with the Baal Shem Tov that was extremely important. Now, the notion of dveikut, of clinging to God, dveikus, this is not an innovation of the Baal Shem Tov. This is the goal of any mystic, unia mystica, to connect, to have a clinging connection to God. But rather what the Baal Shem Tov innovates is a radical, immanentist, even monistic mysticism that God is radically imminent, radically close. In fact, that there may be nothing besides God, which is a radical monism, potentially connected to the best. And this is the, of course, this comes with proof text, and you have the first one on your screen. Lace asar panui mine, from the Zohar. There is no place from which he is absent. There is no place from which he is absent. And if the divine is imminent, if the divine is here, then every act, when performed properly, and kavana or intention is paramount in Kabbalistic thinking, every act, when performed properly, is imbued with holiness. If you ever study Lurianic Kabbalah, you know that Isaac Luria, the Arizal, advanced the notion of sparks in the material world that can be sifted out in a process called tikkun olam, to restore God to his primordial perfectness. So now that idea gets expanded in what's called avodah begashmiut, worship through corporeality. Every act, including eating, sex, anything, work, whatever, every act, when performed properly, can become a mystical act. And this is quite uh, extraordinary. It's, on the one hand, a potentially democratizing ideology, theology, because everyone does those things. Also, obviously, potentially quite dangerous. It could lead to hedonism. It could lead to an ideology where money becomes the focus of religion. And we'll come back to that in a little while. That's Abu Dhabi Gashmiyu. But it also leads to the notion of joy in the mitzvot, joy in life. This is a stereotype of Hasidim, and I think it's overplayed to a certain extent. But you see a theological grounding to it. Because why would you ever, and we see a letter, one of the very few letters of the Baal Shem Tov, criticizing one of his disciples, where he says, I told you, don't fast, don't break yourself. Why would you not realize the joy in everything you're doing when God is right there? You know, uh, the, the, the Arizal, the Arizal had a notion of a tragedy, of, di of a divine explosion, a, a primordial explosion where divinity is tragically trapped in a world close to ourselves. But for the Baal Shem Tov, this becomes not a tragedy, but really more of an opportunity, an ability to connect to God because he is so imminent and really a democratizing, a potentially democratizing. Once you have this democratizing experience, this potential to connect to God in everything you do, this is going to lead to certain beliefs. So the older idea of scholars, led by the great Gershom Shalom and others, was that the best intended this to be democratizing. This goes un, basically accepted and unchallenged for many, many years. And it really aligns with an older historiographical account that Hasidism was a popular revolution. 
that Francoism was in fact not just a popular, but a populist revolution against the uh, rabbinic intelligentsia, against the establishment, whatever that means. And so this went along with that. But now we see evidence in recent scholarship that Besht never intended any of this for the common man. The best was speaking rather, as we'll see in a few minutes, was speaking to an inner circle of mystics. And if that's the case, so what was the innovation? Because the mystical circle was already intending to achieve Dveku. To understand that, we have to see the difference of this whole worldview of imminence. Because until the Baal Shem Tov came along, since the 16th century, the way to achieve Dveku was rather through asceticism. Because the material world was seen as something that blocks you blocks you from achieving that mystical union. So rather, you want to become an ascetic. You want to leave your wife and be celibate. You want to fast as much as possible, uh, roll in, in the snow and freeze your body. Anything to break the material, anything like that would bring you closer. And we have evidence the Baal Shem Tov did this as well. But instead, the Baal Shem Tov says, no. The way to achieve, why would you break the material? If God is everywhere, if God is radically imminent, it is rather through the material, but with the right kavanah, that you can achieve a closeness to God. And so the point here isn't so much who he's speaking to, but the path to achieving Deveku. He's speaking to other mystics, and he's telling them the way to achieve this, it's not through asceticism, but rather in particular through ecstatic prayer. Ecstatic prayer is a mystical experience which they witness in him, and it's something that's a different mystical experience. The Vekut in the old path is going to take you a lifetime of achievement. It's not uh, something that happens frequently. But if your path to mystical union is rather through ecstatic prayer or through avodah v'gashmiyut, it's going to have a different type of experience. It's going to mean, for example, uh, an ephemerality. It's, it's short-lived. It happens. And, you, and, and it ends, and then it will happen again. And that has a social implication, because if a mystic can return from his mystical experience, he doesn't necessarily have to separate from society in order to live this life. He can remain a part of society, even lead that society, and continue to have these, these experiences. And we know that his circle was exactly these people, followers and peers, not only followers, also peers, all of them spiritualists, pneumatics, as one scholar put it, already known as Hasidim, already known as Hasidic, what some people call old-type Hasidic, old-type Hasidim, old-type pietists. These are people who have been striving to achieve this mystical goal, and they are attracted to the Baal Shem Tov. They are attracted to his ideology. We don't have a movement. We don't have a Hasidic movement here, and we certainly don't have masses. We do have evidence that the Baal Shem Tov cared about the masses, that the masses have also had spiritual worth. But his target, his audience, I should say, his, his, his sfiva, his people, his circle, these are other spiritualists, other elite Kabbalists. And if you ask the Baal Shem Tov, are you founding a movement? Have you founded a movement? He would have no idea what you are talking about. He is trying to reshape what it means to be a spiritualist, to be a chassid. Nevertheless, if you look at the totality of what he accomplished and the totality of his ideology, we can see here the kernel of the future movement, both because all of the future leaders of the movement are drawing from the well, the Baal Shem Tov, learning from him or his students, using him as an example. We have a religious innovation here that the Vekut comes not from asceticism, it comes through ecstatic prayer. It comes, it comes through engagement with the material. And we have a social innovation because the unprecedented or virtually unprecedented model of the tzaddik that we'll see in a few minutes, this is based almost completely on the best on his ability to use magical powers and Kabbalistic knowledge and his commitment to the people. So we have here the spark that creates a movement even if the Baal Shem Tov doesn't intend it. What happens when the Baal Shem Tov dies? We're in the 1760s now. When he dies, there is certainly no succession of any kind. There is no movement of any kind. You, to have a succession implies an office and a movement and so on. Nothing like that exists. Uh, there is no obviousness of who's going to replace him. Nevertheless, when he died, 
There is one student who becomes more pronounced than the others, Rabbi Davber, the Magid of Mizrich. Now at this point, Hasidic influence, as such as it exists in the 1760s, uh, is cropping up throughout Podolia, Volhynia, and Galicia. So in other words, southern Ukraine. And the ideas are spreading. But the Magid is going to develop this in certain key ways that are very, very important. Now he's called a Magid, obviously. If you know your Hebrew, you know that means he's a preacher. He is an intellectual. He's a scholar. And he's attracted to the Baal Shem Tov because he's attracted to the success of the Baal Shem Tov and achieving these mystical experiences. Uh, his, his, his erudition was without question. And even those people who suggest that the Baal Shem Tov was speaking to the masses, and again, that's not a dominant idea today, everyone admits Reb Dov Beer was not interested in the masses per se. He was targeting the intellectual elite. There are two aspects of Reb Dov Beer, the Magad of Mezrich, that are particularly important to the development of the Hasidic movement. Number one, the Chatser, the court. He was the Magid of Mizrich. He was based in Mizrich. In other words, it was a place that people made pilgrimage to, to get to him, to be with him, to learn from him, to experience him. And we have first-hand accounts, at least one very famous first-hand account, of going to Mizrich, going to the court, going to a place of pilgrimage, number one. And number two, we have evidence that he was actively trying to recruit people, not exactly to a movement yet, but rather to a way of life. Agents are deliberately sent out to attract people, to come to Mizrich, to be part of what will become the new movement. And the key to their success, the key to the attractiveness, seems to be a combination of a new way of worshiping God and a new leader who both exemplifies the new message, and is committed to teaching others, to connecting with others, to helping them to adopt this new way. This personal contact, the intimate relationship between the leader and what will be each chassid, this is critical. Uh, and this is going to be the, the transformative moment of a Hasidic movement. The, the Magad of Mezrich dies. 1772 is actually a big year. Three different things are happening. One you know already the breakup of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Two, you have the first outbreak of anti-Hasidic behavior, the first cherem, the first excommunication of Hasidim. And three, of course, the Magid dies. Now, at this point, the movement is going to split up into a variety of loosely affiliated courts. And keep in mind, again, because of the uh, division of Poland, these courts are going to be developing in different imperial context. We know that Hasidim are going to cross borders. That's not a problem. Nevertheless, they're going to develop in different imperial contexts. And each of these Hasidim, sorry, each of these courts are going to uh, guard their autonomy quite fiercely. And the older line of understanding this process took us from the Baal Shem Tov as a singular leader of a movement, as people used to think, to Reb Dov Ber, the Magad of Mezrich, as a singular leader of a movement as the old line went, and then the notion that now it's not so centralized. Now each person is going in their own direction. But I think a better way, and this is not my innovation of course, but a better way of understanding this is rather to think the following. In the time of the Baal Shem Tov, you have no movement. You had the Baal Shem Tov and his circle talking about a new way of being a Hasid, a new way of being a Jewish mystic. The same thing is happening under Dov Ber with these innovations we talked about. With the death of Rabbi Dov Ber, we don't have the end of centralization. We actually have the birth of it. There is no centralization under Dov Ber per se. There are other courts, other courts already established during the time of Dov Ber. For example, Rabbi Avram of Kalisk and Rabbi Aaron of Karlin. They have already courts in his lifetime. Once there, there's no assumption that they shouldn't be that way. Once he dies, then we have centralization. Then we have strong centralized courts, but federalized each one guarding its autonomy quite, quite fiercely. Now, we don't have yet dynastic succession. That takes time to emerge. The first dynastic succession happens in 1798 with the Chernobyl Rebbe, when his son succeeds him, and it takes two or three more decades before that becomes absolutely firm. But at the same time this is happening, the relationship with the masses is changing. As the masses flood the Hasidic movement, we have a problem. First of all, the term chassid begins to mean 
not the leaders, the inner circle of the movement, but rather the followers. And the term that is seized upon to describe the leaders of the movement is Sadiq. And this is an inversion because traditionally those two terms meant something quite different. In the Talmud, for example, the Sadiq was a good guy and the Hasid was the super Jew. These terms are being switched and it's being switched and that's, there's a reason for that. For centuries in Kabbalah, the term Sadiq was something that people seized upon. And the reason for it, among other reasons, is because of a verse that says, Sadiq Yesod Olam. A Sadiq is the foundation of the world. A lovely, lovely verse. But if you know your Kabbalah, you know that Yesod is not just foundation. Yesod is also the ninth sphira, the ninth aspect of the emanation of God in the, in the world. And Yesod on the anthropomorphism of that emanation is the phallus. It's the channel by which all shefa, all bounty, all, all spirituality and light and so on is flowing down to shechina, malchut, the feminine aspect of that structure, also representing the world and the Jewish people in particular. Which means that the tzaddik is, as Arthur Green famously wrote in an article, the axis mundi around which the world revolves. The tzaddik is the pipeline, the channel by which all godliness, all, all of that comes down to us. And so there is a reason why they like the term tzaddik. And in this new world we've just described of federalized centralization and leaders as tzaddikim and followers as chassidim, we have a new reality. Because now being a chassid, you cannot just be a chassid anymore, at least by the early 1800s. When somebody is a chassid from the 19th century until today, the question is, of whom? You are a chassid of a specific court. And when your children are grown, they will be a chassidim of the same court and of the son or son-in-law of the Rebbe before him. This becomes part and parcel of an entire identity. And all the social issues uh, co from kosher slaughter on to, to, sh to shiduchim and matches and so on and so forth. All of these things. And this is not necessarily, by the way, uh, grounded on where you live. Somewhat it is. Some courts are stronger in some places and some in other places, but this could continue even after you move. And we have the whole variety of courts, some of which you've heard of, Bells, Bubov, Satmer, Lubavitch, Chor uh, Chortkov, and so on and so on. All of these are placed names in Eastern Europe with which the tzaddik is associated. The most important for us, I'll mention Galicia here now, uh, one of them is the Bells Hasidic group founded by Shalom Rokeach. The biggest group in Galicia is probably Sans, founded by Chaim Halberstam. We'll come to these again later and you read about them in the, in the assigned readings for today. The most famous may be Rabbi Israel of Ruzhin, who is coming actually out of the Russian Empire, but flees the Russian Empire when he's on the hook for a murder. He allegedly had a couple informants of the Jewish community killed. He flees the Russian Empire and makes his way to the Austrian Empire, and there he settles and his children establish other courts still. Uh, and many of these tzaddikim, their children are establishing other courts. So for example, the Rebbe, the Chaim Halbasham's sons, many of them establish future Hasidic groups, including most famously Babov. There are also tzaddikim who don't establish courts, most famously Lev Yitzchak of Berdichev, who never actually has a court established. Because of, of that, in the 19th century, we have really an extreme atomization and competition between Hasidic groups, and it leads to many conflicts, most famously in Galicia, this, the conflict between Sanz and Sadagor, which I'll come back to, but it also leads to the development of a very rich, diverse mosaic of Hasidic groups, each with their own theology, each with their own customs, and so on. Let's take a moment to talk, finally, about the Tzaddik. Really, Hasidism is, as I said, most innovative and most controversial contribution to Jewish theology. A little bit. The tzaddik, as I said, the notion of a perfect man, this paradigm of the person uh, around whom the world uh, revolves, that he is the reason why the world exists. This is not uh, an innovation of Hasidic movement. What Hasidic movement innovates instead is the idea of creating an actual social organization around 
actual tzaddikim in the world. You know who they are. They are a new form of leader, and you can go to them, and you should go to them, and they are putting their services to work for you. They are, they, this is absolutely unprecedented, and they know it. They know it. They are aware of it, and they search for Kabbalistic and other sorts of proof texts to defend this. Where do these come from? So let's talk about a couple rounds of this. First of all, Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya, one of the two or three major students of the Baal Shem Tov. And he is going to develop certain ideas of the tzaddik which are very important, including the tzaddik as the key figure drawing down Shefa. He is most interested in talking about the Magid, the preacher, because the Hasidic movement is very interested in that role. The rabbi's role in pre-modern Jewish society is to be a posik, to be a legalist ruler. That's his job. The preacher's job is to be the guardian of the spiritual and ethical ethos of the people. And that's what interests Hasidic leaders. And so Yaakov Yosef Pinoy is his solution to preachers who find themselves not effectively helping the people to whom they preach, is to understand the ontological relationship, that they are bound to those people. And in this way, when one goes up, it pulls the other up or pulls the other down, that there's a chain between them. There's an interdependence between the tzaddik and the people, an organic relationship, a spiritually organic relationship. And the key is you can't separate yourself from the people. You are bound to them and you have to recognize them and the people have to recognize their attachment to the preacher, They have to the tzaddik. They have to recognize that and act on it. That's quite innovative. Now, when the masses start coming to this new movement, developing in the 1780s and 1790s, there's a real question. How do you communicate these ideals of Hasidic movement? If you read the theology, for example, of the Magid of Mezrich, these are very, very sophisticated ideas of what's called bitul hayesh, for example, of what's called bitul hayesh, self-effacement, completely losing yourself in the divine light. The ideas of, of the Magid were not intended for the common people. I mean, he did speak maybe humility and so on. But what do you do when the masses are coming and they want to join a movement that was not designed for them? So you have two choices. You know, the, the question is, what kind of a price are you willing to pay? How high a price? How much are you willing to change the theology, to change what you're doing in order to incorporate the masses? And we're going to see many systems like this, but two important ones are on your screen now. Elimelech of the Zhensk, the Noam Elimelech, and Shinozaman of Liadi, who becomes the founder of the Chabad, Chabad Lubavitch dynasty. There are many others. Let's speak about these for a minute. Elimelech of the Zhensk, the dominant figure in West Galicia and much of Poland for that matter. His disciples include many of the most important people in early 19th century Hasidic history, Yaakov Yitzchak, Horowitz, the Chose, the seer of, 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 of Lublin, the Magid of Kozhenitz, Menachem Mendel of, Rimen, Rimen, of Rimenov, which I mentioned him last uh, class, Abraham Joshua Heschel of Apt, many, many, many others. He was willing to pay a pretty high price. He was advocating a much more popular Hasidism. He is prepared to pay a high price to include the masses in the movement to lower his spiritual expectations. What does he say? Number one, a Hasidic leader is able and committed to take care of the physical daily needs of the people, of his people, because his prayer is so effective and because he is so committed to his responsibility. And from Elimelech, we get the innovative idea of the tzetl, of the pan, the, pid, the, the pidyon nefesh, where the Hasid comes and he writes his name and his mother's name and his needs and so on, and he's wrapping this around some kind of monetary contribution, which is designed, theoretically, to connect him to his tzaddik. And when he get, gives us the tzaddik, the tzaddik is taking this and thereby able to give, give him whatever blessings that he needs. That's number one. This is a tremendous innovation. But number two, what about the spiritual aspect? Since the chassid can no longer achieve veku by himself, he should do it rather vicariously, through the mediation of the tzaddik. He should cling, and the word again is dvekut, lidbok. He should cling to the tzaddik by obeying him and supporting him materially and so on. This connects him 
metaphysically to the tzaddik. This is a compromise. This is a, this is a serious compromise. This is not the mystical experience of the best or of the Magid, but it does enable many Hasidim to achieve some level of mystical experience, which is quite real for them. Uh, and this is the final inversion of that terminology we spoke about a few minutes ago between Hasid and Tzadik, because in Nomad Melech, the Tzadik is always the Tzadik, and he's always one, and the Hasid is always the Hasid. Uh, and again, like we saw with Yaakov Yosef, this is not simply an option. This is not an opportunity. For Nomad Melech, this is a prerequisite to proper divine service. If you want to serve God properly, you must connect to the tzaddik, that the, that, to your tzaddik. You must do this. Now, Shneur Zalman is different. He has a very different approach. Shneur Zalman is the leader of the Chassidim, rather in, in White Russia, in the northern part of the, of the, so, of the future Pale of Settlement, and so on. And when his teacher, Menachem Mendel Vitebsk, moves to Palestine, he becomes the leader of, of the Chassidim there. And he follows his teacher, and he says, that's not what I'm about. The Hasidic leader is not supposed to provide physical superna or supernatural assistance for your physical needs. The best was unique. He did miracles. I don't do miracles. Now, he's pressured about this, and eventually he says, okay, if you have a material problem uh, and you can't get anyone to help you, you can narrow it to two choices. You don't know which way to go. Once a year, you come to me, and I'll, 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 maybe, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you advice. I'll give you advice. That's all I'm doing is giving you Now, it may have been more than just advice for them, but for him it was advice. That's not his point. The Hasidic leader is also not a mediator between the Hasid and God. That's not his point either. He's rather a spiritual guide. He does have the metaphysical connection to you, that's for sure. But he's giving you guidance. He's guiding you on your path to achieve what you need. This was obviously attractive. He became so flooded with Hasidim over the years that eventually he laid out rules preventing Hasidim from coming to him too often. He had very strict rules and he complained about it. He saved most visits for new Hasidim. Old Hasidim could only come once a year, only one Shabbat a month was set for them and so on. It's a remarkable case where a tzaddik is limiting visitors to his court. And he's quite attacked for this because when he gets overwhelmed enough, he actually posts his ideas in a famous book called the Tanya, and he's attacked for sharing Kabbalistic secrets with the masses. But he felt this was the way to go. Uh, there are other examples as well. I don't have time to speak about them. Famously, Nachman of Bratslav, uh, who had his own theology, which you can study on your own. Uh, the one that interests me the most is Israel Friedman of Ruzhin. As I mentioned, he fled the Russian Empire. He comes to Austria. He se settles eventually in Sadagora, which is in uh, Bukovina, part of Galicia at the time. He develops an ideology of Hasidism uh, called sometimes the, the regal way. The ideology f goes as follows. Most of us don't have the spiritual capacity to have the right kavana, the right intention when we engage with Abu Dhabi Gash Miyut, when, we're, when I'm having this, this water, theoretically, I'm able to have a spiritual experience. There's a spark of divinity that's captured in this water, and uh, I have been uh, preordained to be the one to have this cup of water, and by drinking it with the, white, with the right intention, mm, I'm able to liberate the divine spark that's been trapped in here since the beginning of time. And that same would be true of the hamburger I'm hoping to have tonight for dinner, uh, or whatever else I'm going to be doing with my life. But the problem is most of us aren't really able to have the kind of kavana. Only the tzaddikim, only they are able truly to liberate the divine sparks trapped in the material world. And that's the case. And if the point of redeeming the sparks is not only our own personal experience, but also eventually messianic redemption, then the most logical course of action would be to hand over all the material wealth to the tzaddik so that he can use it with the proper kavana. And thus begins what is known um, became popularized especially by David Asaf as the regal way, as the regal way. So if you look here, you can see some of the images of the regal way. These are all in Galicia, Sadagor and Chortkov uh, and others, um, quite remarkable. And these are in cities that are surrounded by a lot of poverty. But this was the way of this Hasidic group, not only of of Israel of Rujin, but also of his sons became rabbis, and as I said, in Sadagor and Chortkov and elsewhere. 
Uh, incidentally, you can see here uh, one of the, the, the main uh, synagogue of the Wunder Rabbi in Sadagora uh, on the bottom left. and the upper right, you can see that it still exists and is being redesigned, refitted, re, uh, refurbished, and the Hasidim are coming back, and they're buying up apartments. One of those two pictures, by the way, is me, and one of them is from 100 years ago. I'll let you decide which is which. Bells has the same idea. Bells has the same idea. It's not from the same family, but look at the synagogue and look at the way it's constructed today in Jerusalem. It's magnificent. And actually, uh, you should take the time, if you're in Israel now, to go to Jerusalem. And when you approach the Court of Bells, it really looks like a temple. The temple is destroyed and Bells is there. And this notion that's been that of the Court of the, Chas, of the Tzaddik as being the place to where, where you go on pilgrimage, not to Jerusalem, not to the temple. Rather, you go to the court of the Rebbe, of the Tzaddik, and there you'll experience the closest of God that was once accomplished three times a year when the ancient Israelites went to the temple. Uh, in Chabad today, there is a village in Israel called Kfar Chabad, uh, filled with Chabad Hasidim, and they built there a replica of 770 Eastern Parkway, the court of the Rebbe, who is no longer with us, uh, in New York, in Brooklyn. They're rebuilding the court from Brooklyn in Israel. Here they're rebuilding the court in Bells in Israel. That's the place, that's the temple, and we're trying to capture it as best we can. That's the ideology happening here. Now, Hasidic movement is going to draw position. It's going to draw position from two different sources, and I don't have a lot of time to talk about either one, but I want to mention a few words about it. The opponents of the Hasidic movement become known as mitnagdim, which literally just means opponents. And you have a wave of excommunications and other efforts against the Hasidic movement, led most famously by the Gra, the Vilna Gaon, uh, the greatest uh, rabbinic authority at the time, and there are reasons for it. They were afraid of another Sabbatian heresy. These Sabbatian heresies are still popping up in 18th century, throughout the 18th century, even into the 19th century. And they were quite afraid of this, along with many of the theological tenets, uh, the popularization of Kabbalah, uh, especially the prioritizing of prayer over Torah study. Uh, the idea that the unlearned Jews could be learning Kabbalah or achieving Dvekut, worship through corporeality which is a potentially quite a hedonistic ideology. They were worried about all of these things and more. And there was quite an effort between the Mitnagdim and the Hasidim for many, many years as a result of that. The real reason the conflict subsided, there was no leadership in the Vilna Gaon anymore. His disciple wasn't able to muster the same kind of authority. But the real reason was simply that the Hasidic movement didn't go the way they expected. And instead, there was a greater danger of modernization, the absolute state, the Haskalah above all, and the conflict between the Mitnagdim and the Hasidim paled in comparison to that. And they become allies instead against modernization. Because in the end of the day, Hasidic movement never really challenged normative Judaism. The innovation of the Tzaddik is real and it's important, but that what they are really doing is continuing and progressing earlier trends that had popularized Kabbalistic ideas and, ideas and practices and really tried to accommodate a devotional life to individuals, pe individual people's personal religious experiences. But the halakha remained the halakha, and they never tried to undermine that, with the one exception of the lack of attention to the times of prayers among certain groups. And by the second, third, fourth cent decade of the 19th century, Hasidic movement had become dominant, not exclusive. Not everybody was a Hasid in Eastern Europe, but it had certainly by mid-19th century become the dominant form of Judaism in most of Eastern Europe, uh, especially uh, the, uh, in southern in Ukraine, Galicia, and Poland. Uh, really, uh, actually, it had inroads in white Russia and Lithuania, pretty much everywhere where Yiddish continues to be the spoken language of the Jews, Hasidic movement does very well. In places where Yiddish becomes replaced over the course of the 19th century with the local non-Jewish language, that's the border. Hasidic movement doesn't penetrate. But where Yiddish remains the language of the Jewish people, 
by the mid-19th century, and scholars debate exactly which decades, by mid-19th century, Hasidic movement is quite dominant. And as such, as you see, it becomes not a revolutionary force, but a conservative force. It becomes a populism, but one that acts as a bulwark against modernization, against acculturation. And as actually in the Russian Empire and, and even in Austria, as the power and, and integrity of the, of the Kahila structure is collapsing, the Hasidic movement steps up. The Hasidic aristocracy becomes the new leaders. It's a voluntary leadership, but people do respect it. And some of the functions that the Kahila used to do, so for example, appointing, even appointing rabbis, defending uh, a Jew's right to a lease, the Chazaka, appointing butchers, and so on, these things fall on the new Hasidic aristocracy, which by the, by the late 19th century is mostly a closed aristocracy. People can no longer break in and establish their own Hasidic group quite so easily as they could in the beginning of that century. And that aristocracy is truly an aristocracy. The children of one Rebbe are going to marry children of another Rebbe, and so on. Not just any Rebbe, of course, we've seen conflicts. Uh, I mentioned one, the sans Satagora conflict. I didn't talk about it very much. This was an incredible conflict. Actually, in 1869, um, in 1869, the son of the Rebbe leaves the Hasidic world and leaves the Jewish world for a while. And eventually, he returns to it before he passes away. But because of that, that leads to an idea in the sans Hasidic group that the regal way was the cause of this terrible apostasy. And it becomes a real explosion of, of, of strife between these two groups that lasts for a few years intensely and then even uh, less intensely for many decades thereafter. Um, so there is strife between these groups, but they are no longer uh, trying to upend society. I don't know if they ever were, but they surely weren't then. And the Mitnagdim know this. And the Mitnagdim and the Hasidim essentially view each other as uh, different, maybe the other's inferior, but different acceptable paths of Jewish worship. And they stop accusing each other of heresy. Uh, and I want to end by making one point uh, besides the conservative role of the, of the, of the Hasidic movement in 19th and 20th century. Uh, if you read this readings we have for today, we have on the one hand an older scholarship of Mahler and we have the newer scholarship of, uh, of Rachel Manikin, the two assigned readings. You'll notice a difference because in the older scholarship, and this was quite uh, uh, dominant for many decades, Hasidic movement is viewed as being under attack. You know, that the absolutist regime is trying to assimilate the Jews and the Hasidic movement is fighting against it. Now it's true the Hasidic movement will resist the Haskalahs. We'll see next time. And it's true the Hasidic movement uh, is, not, is resisting modernization. But the absolutist state was not out to stop the Hasidic movement. Far from it. In the, in the Galician case, from the very beginning of Austrian rule virtually, from Joseph II, there's religious freedom in Galicia. And the Austrian state guarantees the right of the Hasidim to worship as they wish. And even in Russian Empire from 1804, Hasidim are protected as a legitimate form of Judaism. So that notion of Mahler, for all of the important contributions the work makes, is being very much revised. And that's why I paired those readings together. I think you'll see that quite clearly when you look at them one against the other. We'll stop here, and next time we'll take a look at the Haskalah, at the Jewish Enlightenment, where it comes from, how it goes to Galicia, and how it transforms Jewish life there. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Dovid Zenya.